at recording your live. Welcome back, Global Supply Chainers. So we are going to start with the, we have received very good questions about Samsung, Hanjing, and Brexit. We are going to start with the Samsung case study, Professor Sheffi. So first thing, why did you think that this Samsung disruption happened? Hi, everybody. Samsung was an interesting case, still is an interesting case, and I will uh, compare it or uh, talk about it in relationship to the Volkswagen scandal, because in many ways, both of them happened for the same reason. Samsung tried to beat the iPhone 7 and go out with the Note 7 before the new iPhone came out. So instead of worrying about quality and making sure that everything works, they try to get to the market too fast. By the way, they repeated the same mistake. After the problem with the batteries was discovered, they took on less than two weeks in order to say they found the problem, they fixed the problem, they can supply worldwide the new uh, Note 7, they have a whole new um, system of replacing the phones, and Again, it was too fast. Turns out it was still a problem. So they ended up with a, a, first a recall, and then they stopped selling it. The stock dropped by more than 10%. They lost, uh, by some estimate, between 2 and $3 billion. But more importantly is the long-term hit to the company's reputation. Uh, it was the same thing that happened with Volkswagen. Volkswagen was pushed very hard rather than worry about the the cars and the quality and the customer service, they try to beat Toyota. They try to make sure that they are the number one volume uh, car producer in the world. And they took their eyes off the ball in that sense. And add to this, to the vanity that caused all this, is the fact that they uh, did not want to use the diesel technology used by uh, BMW and Mercedes, they want to develop their own, and the engineers simply couldn't do it. So they were pushed to the limit, and at the end, they simply cheated and got caught. And again, a huge um, loss. They are facing you know, tens of billions of dollars in fines all over the world. For example, in South Korea, you cannot buy now a Volkswagen uh, diesel car. The government doesn't allow them to sell it. In, uh, South Korea, and there are fines in the U.S. and in Europe, in, uh, uh, in Asia. And again, the long-term problem is the hit to the reputation. So in both of these cases, the company leadership took their eyes off the real reasons for being in business and tried to hit goals that had nothing to do with business, like being first to the market, doing things very quickly, or beating uh, Toyota instead of being the number one car seller uh, in the world with bad results. Mm -hmm. Yes, I fully agree. I fully agree with this long-term impact. Um, in terms of the impact of, on, on the competitors, what, what are your thoughts? Uh, with Hanjin, with, with, with uh, Samsung. Uh, Samsung, it's the best thing that could have ever could have happened to Apple. Uh, most people are not likely to switch from uh, Samsung, which is based on the Android system, to uh, Apple, which has its own iOS, its own uh, operating system, because it's so different, and it's tied to the whole ecosystem of, uh, uh, of Apple. But as it happens, at the same time that Samsung had its uh, trouble with the, uh, uh, with the Note 7, Apple came up with a new phone that uses the latest Android system. It looks very similar to the Samsung phone. It's an Android phone, and it looks like it's going to be very successful in the marketplace because a lot of people are going to go, want to stay with the Android system, but lost some trust in the uh, in Samsung. As an aside, by the way, Samsung is offering seventy-five dollars to anybody who returns the uh, the uh, the Note Seven and buy any other product of Samsung. They're trying desperately to keep to keep hold. Of the, of the customer and don't let them defect. We'll see how that works. Mm -hmm. So then let's say that Google was one of the most... Google is the one, and of course, every other Android, uh, yeah, the, the, the LG or the Chinese ones, but mm -hmm. 
Apple came out with a, this is a very high-end phone, the Note 7. So it's the people who buy high-end phones. These are the people who will buy the, um, the Apple, the, the, new, um, the new Google phone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then let's move now to the Brexit. Um, one of our students are interested in knowing about how will, uh, Brit uh, how will this Britain exit affect the trade especially with the European Union in terms of this global economy, economy and um, barrier to trade. Yes, uh, Brexit was obviously a surprise to many people because a lot of the uh, polls leading to the, to the Brexit vote uh, did not indicate that the uh, leavers, as, uh, as the people who wanted to leave the EU, will be, will be successful, but they were. And right now, it looks like we are heading towards what's called a hard Brexit. The problem is that the EU would like to keep its, its trade relationship with EU. Uh, and the Brits need the EU. This is the, the biggest trading bloc that they have. But not only this, through the EU, they have their trading agreement with uh, all the rest of the world. They don't have their own trade agreement at all. They all have it through the EU. But the main reasons that the leavers voted to leave the EU was they wanted to control immigration into the uh, uh, into Britain, and this is just incompatible with. Uh, um, so they they want to stop the free movement of uh, of people, and this is one of the tenets of the EU. The EU can if the EU will give up to Britain on this, the EU might as well not exist. So the EU is not going to give up on this, and the Brits, give, given the vote, cannot give up on cannot agree to, uh, uh, to allow immigration in, which means that there will be no agreement. And the chances are, my estimate is we are I don't know, 60, 70 percent that we are heading towards what's called a hard Brexit, which means Britain will not have access to the EU and will have to renegotiate all its trade agreement. We are starting to see the first effect of this. After the, after the initial effect of the pound losing a lot of its value, and making British, uh, the British trade relationship, uh, uh, British groups more competitive. Um, this was the first few weeks after the uh, after the Brexit vote. Now we see reality setting in. First of all, inflation is in uh, in the UK is starting to uh, uh, to perk up. Some of it we saw in the relationship between uh, Unilever and uh, uh, Tesco. But this is just, this is absolutely the start. Lots of, even most of the goods that are being manufactured in Britain use parts that come from, from the EU, from Germany, from Spain, from France. Mm -hmm. Now think about what will happen. Those parts will have tariff on them. And then when car or product comes out of Europe to the EU, they'll have another tariff on them. So we will have the, um, the uh, British product are just not going to be competitive. By the way, we saw it when uh, Carlos Ghosn, the CEO of uh, Nissan and, uh, and Renault, um, had a meeting just last week with uh, the new Prime Minister of, uh, uh, of England, May, and he came saying that she agreed to make Nissan whole mm -hmm. if Nissan would keep investing in Britain. This means that, by the way, this is another thing that's illegal based on the EU rules because this is government subsidies Definitely. to manufacturing. Yeah. It, the EU does not allow this. So none of this is going to happen. And in fact, if they offer subsidy, the EU will raise the tariff. Even <laughs> so it's Britain, I believe Britain is a no-win situation. And the, the problem is that at the beginning, the real effect takes a long time. And furthermore, at the beginning, people still were toying with the idea that Britain, that the UK can retain its access to the, to the EU. But given the EU response today, and given the fact that for any trade agreement, all 27 countries have to agree, you can always count on at least five of them not to agree to anything. It, it's inconceivable to me that Britain will be able to get access to the, to the EU. And by the way, they'll use so-called passport rights, which means the financial industry in London will take a huge hit. And already we see, you know, I'm working in Luxembourg now, 
And we all will see people in Luxembourg, in France, in Germany, wooing bankers in London to try to come with giving them lots of uh, tax advantages and other in order to, you know, uh, to, to come to in. Them. And it looks like if London is going to lose its place as the financial capital of Europe, manufacturing is going to take a hit. In my estimate, the Brits are up for a, a generation, I'm talking about 25, 30 years mm -hmm. of uh, decline. Unfortunately, it will also impact Europe. It mm -hmm. will also impact the rest of the EU. And we see, we see problems in, in the EU as well. Now, I must say, this will take uh, May, the, the Prime Minister announced that by end of March 2017, they'll uh, invoke Article 50, which means they have two years, two years to negotiate. It's hard to imagine how ridiculous this sounds. In the last seven years, the EU has been trying to do a trade agreement with Canada, where both countries wanted it. They still don't have it, and now it looks like it's dead. So and this was seven years of people who are uh, you know, professional negotiators. Britain, by, by the way, because doesn't have any trade negotiators. They have to train somebody to do it. They have to train hundreds of people to do it. Uh, it is hard to imagine anything but so-called hard Brexit, where Britain leaves the EU, has no trade agreement, mm -hmm. the country plunged into bad recession, close to a depression, and we'll see. Uh, to me, there are only two options that are realistic. One of them is so-called hard Brexit, recession, depression. Mm -hmm. Another one is a year and a half into the process, somebody in Britain wakes up and says, this was the stupidest thing we ever tried. <laughs> <laughs> and, this is hard the to believe. And they, have, they, have, they have the mechanism to do you it. You heard it here first. Because Parliament, Parliament has to decide on, on final decision on, on Brexit. And Parliament can absolutely revoke what the, uh, um, what the referendum suggested. <laughs> so I see only two possible. I would say 90% the first one, maybe 10, less than 10%, the, the, second uh, the second one, because the second one requires unbelievable leadership. The second one requires telling people, we know what you want, but you were wrong. And we are the parliament, and we will make the decision that's good for everybody. But the world in general is so missing such leadership. Anywhere, I'm talking in the United mm -hmm. States, in, in Europe, anywhere, anywhere, that it's hard to imagine. Anyway, I gave you a long answer to a short question. No, this is good. <laughs> no, but connect very well with the Ajay question. Ajay is one of our students. He's working in Unilever, and, and he wants to, to oh, ask yes. you, uh, what is, uh, how should companies uh, plan for this kind of disruption? What can I do? I work yeah. for Unilever. I yeah. just saw the, 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 the dispute between Tesco and Unilever. So what can we do? Just for those who don't realize this, uh, Unilever told Tesco that they tried to raise the price of some stuff that's actually made in England but using components that are made in Europe. Mm -hmm. So, the, of course, the uh, average British voter said, why are they raising the price? It's made right here in England. Well, but it has ingredients that are brought from Germany, from France, from the rest of Europe. And so, because of the uh, weak pound, they don't get enough to cover their cost. So mm -hmm. Unilever wants to raise the price. My guess at the end of the day, this is just the tip of the iceberg. You'll see price, I see inflation going up in, uh, uh, in pound terms. We're just seeing the beginning of this. And my guess, we will see bad inflation. Companies will raise prices. They have no choice but doing this. They, companies cannot lose on every item and make it up in volume. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just lose more. Companies cannot for the long term. They can sustain some losses to lose, uh, uh, to keep market share. And by the way, you see it happening in uh, luxury goods. So if you want to buy a Prada pocketbook or some other, uh, or a Rolex watch, the cheapest place to buy today is London. Because you buy it in sterling, and in order to keep the market share, all these companies have huge margin. They can withstand this. Mm -hmm. When you sell something in Tesco supermarket, you have very, very limited margin. You cannot withstand it. Mm -hmm. So 
the most of the British population will feel it because they cannot withstand these companies that sell in Tesco and in uh, you know any department store cannot withstand the low pound, the low pound. So they'll have to raise the price. And the problem is uh, the problem with uh, Unilever is that they have to go first. But uh, it will be a wave, and it's not going to affect Unilever because everybody else will have to do it. They mm -hmm. cannot withstand it for a long time. Yeah, great answer. So let's move now to the hunting case. Our students are interested in knowing the long-term effect of the hunting bank corruption case. Yes, and, this, and the question actually mentioned uh, some of this. First of all, uh, the context. The Hanjin case happened when the uh, situation of most maritime companies is very shaky. The prices are extremely low and they don't cover replacement cost. Companies do not create, do not replenish the capital to be able to uh, replace assets or keep assets. So because of this uh, low prices, this is just the first. This is the, the canary. There are many, many smaller companies that are teetering on the verge of bankruptcy, which means, and shippers know it. So the response is shippers is to make it even worse because there's a, as the uh, person who asked said, there's a flight to quality. You want to make sure that uh, your cargo does not get stuck like the hunting shippers for weeks and months when you cannot take it out. So you don't go to the lowest price. You don't go to the small uh, ocean carriers. You go to the big one. You go to Merck. You go to... And all these guys can expect their uh, market share to go up, uh, which means it will only accelerate the plight of the smaller carriers. The result can be... Um, there can be two results with Seaport because of them. There may be some more carriers that will go down and we'll see a wave of consolidation. The small carriers will sell themselves basically to the larger carrier. So we will expect the um, MERSC of the world uh, and the sea and others to grow mm -hmm. and uh, not make much money because the price is still low, but in the long term, the growth can help them control more, more of the market and actually reduce capacity and stabilize, I don't know if increase the rate, stabilize the rate. The problem with this, the underlying issue is that trade is not, for the first time in decades, trade is not growing at the level the GDP is growing. Yeah. Trade is growing, trade used to grow twice and three times faster than world GDP. Mm -hmm. It's not the case. Furthermore, you have to look at the political system. In the United States, both parties are against trade now. Both parties, Democrat and Republican, are against trade. You see this, you see Brexit is actually a vote against trade. There's a lot of parties in the, uh, in the EU who are on the right and they've become more, more nationalistic, more, uh, more against trade. You see what's happening in the South China Sea. The companies are becoming leery of uh, what's happening with China and it may affect the uh, trade. So trade in general is going down, which means maritime shipping is going down because that's the main uh, engi engine of trade, the main engine of, uh, of economic growth. So we are, we are up for a few years of uh, trying time all over the world. Hmm. Okay, so we have one question for an expert in supply chain management. <laughs> this is, what is the difference between resilient company and an agile company? Okay, let's define, define the term. Resilience is the ability of a company to bounce back after a disruption. Resilience is a term taken from a, a, a material science. Mm -hmm. It's the ability of a material to get back its former shape after it gets some to time of yeah. to recover, basically. Uh, so this, we're talking about, we're talking about resilient company, we're talking about mm -hmm. its ability to get back to the former level of uh, uh, production, level of service, customer mm -hmm. service, whatever, after, after it's, being, it's being disrupted. Agility is one of the ways that companies can achieve that. Companies can achieve that by having lots of inventory. It's expensive, but there's a way, way to achieve it. Mm -hmm. Companies can achieve it by having, uh, you know, several, uh, you know, multiple suppliers. Company can, 
there, there are many ways that companies can achieve it. Being flexible and agile, which means it's the ability to move fast. It's a, it has several elements. It's a structural element of how the supply chain can be structured. It has cultural element of yeah. how people in the company think about and prepare for um, anything that can happen. I always say that one of the best quote is from Andy Grove, who used to be the CEO of Intel, who said, only the paranoid survive. <laughs> Intel is a company that always looks behind, behind its back to see if there's yeah. somebody coming, coming at them. And it helps them keep, keep on their toes. And there's one of the best companies, if you read some of my writing, and mm -hmm. I talk to dozens of companies, I always put Intel as the gold standard in terms of always being ready, always thinking that uh, they now think on top of the world, but they can be toppled any, any minute. Yeah. So they watch it, they try to, they try to, to go to, um, to cell phone, to Internet of Things, mm -hmm. because they see that the PC cell are going down, even though they had a very good quarter. Uh, last quarter, the PC cells actually uh, went up, but they are getting into automotive big time. They are getting into many other markets. Mm -hmm. It's part of always looking behind the shoulders and seeing somebody is coming to get us, even though it's amazing because they have like 80% of the market in most markets they're in, yeah. but they are absolutely not sitting on the laurels and just <laughs> waiting for something to happen. So they build, they build inventory in some places, they build relationship with extra suppliers, they, they have a lot of uh, uh, software that looks at everything that happens around the world to get ready for something. They have a whole system of uh, emergency operations centers in each one of the plane, they have a corporate emergency operations center that uh, um, communicates between all these and uh, coordinates uh, response to disruption. Mm -hmm. They have communication system at every one of the plane, from telephone and internet and satellite phone and, and, and ham radio in every one of them, so they can always communicate. They're ready. They, are, they always expect something to go wrong. <laughs> and so, as I said, this is not only supply chain; it is a cultural issue. Definitely. And at the same time. Zara, um, they, from the Inditex Group, it's a great example also for agile supply chain based on this very, centralized uh, warehouse in the region. Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. Okay, so I think we are on time. Thanks a lot, Professor Shepard, sure, for joining pleasure. us today. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the event. Um, good luck with the final exam. See you soon. Bye. See you guys. Good luck.